It is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen? It is good. It is a blessing to be here and worship God with you. If it's your first time here, welcome. Uh, my name is Scotty James. I'm one of the pastors here. All right, let's get into it. If you have a Bible, Genesis chapter 3 is where we shall be. Genesis 3. If you don't have a bulletin, I'd encourage you to raise your hand and get a bulletin. The scripture will be on there. I always encourage you to bring a, a, a Bible. If you don't have one, you can look up on the screen. You can follow through that way as well. Genesis chapter 3. If you're new to the Bible, Genesis is the very first book. Are we there? All right. I'll pray, and then we're going to get into it. I'm excited. Lord, as I pray almost every week, protect us, God. Protect us from going through the motions. We are prone to wander. We are prone to check out. We are prone to sit here for 45 minutes and check off our religious duty and then go home unchanged. Protect us, God. We want this time to have eternal impact. And it can if we focus and believe these things by faith. So give us the grace, God. We want to be transformed as we worship you through the receiving of your word. Help us pay attention. Help us to apply. Help us not to think this is for someone else, but to receive it for our own soul. If we would believe these words today, it would bring life to our very soul. Help us, God. You know, we pray all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Genesis 3, chapter, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. I'll read it. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the fruit, of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. If you've been around, we've been going through life in the spirit asking what does that mean and how do we practically do this? And for the past couple weeks, we've been looking at spiritual warfare and Satan and his schemes and things of that nature. So a question I think we have to ask ourselves is this. Are the bad things that are happening in and around me, are they Satan or are they me? It's a fair question. Is, is everything that happens in the world that's bad Satan? Or is sometimes it's simply just me and my foolishness that's, that's causing this? When I go to the, to the store and there's a long line. Is that Satan scheming against me? Or is that I just went to the store at the same time that a lot of people went to? Is anybody go to buffets here? Y'all are too embarrassed to admit you go to buffets? <laughs> anybody go to buffets? Okay. So if you go to a buffet and you eat too much ice cream and you have a bellyache, seriously, was that Satan tempting you? Or did you just lack self-control? and eat too much ice cream and now you got a bellyache? This is a, a, a real question. How do I know if it's Satan or if it's me? There's a couple of world events that I wanna uh, point out because I think these world events are popular enough for everybody to identify with them and they're atrocious enough for us all to reasonably agree that Satan was likely and his demons likely behind those events. One of those events is uh, the Holocaust and 9-11. If you're familiar with the Holocaust, in 19, I think it was from 1941 to 1945, uh, there was something like 11 million people put to death, more than half of those being, being Jews. In Germany, uh, 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 a leader arose named Adolf Hitler who led this Nazi party and with the goal of exterminating the Jewish race and, and really taking over the world. And 
millions of people were put to death in the most atrocious, heinous ways imaginable. I'm confident in saying that Satan was behind that. Then 60 years later, you have uh, another atrocious thing on American soil, 9-11, where people hijacked four different planes and flew them into buildings and into fields that led to, I think, close to 3,000 people being, being killed that day. And so in both instances, I, I think Satan, you can say reasonably that Satan was behind or involved in those world events. Now, as I pondered this this past week, what stood out to me was what was Satan's weapon? What was the weapon that Satan leveraged to bring about so much pain and destruction upon the earth? And what's interesting is that I, I think it was the same weapon in both situations. In fact, if you go through all of world history and the most atrocious things that have happened, I think it's fair to say that the same weapon was used in every one of those things. So what was it? Was it military power? No. Was military power involved? Sure, but I, I think there's something deeper than just military power. Was it governmental power? No. Yes, governmental power was involved, but that's not the weapon. It's not guns. It's not nuclear weapons, it's not explosives, it's not any of that stuff. To me, the primary weapon that Satan uses to bring pain and destruction on this earth are thoughts. Thoughts. That's what he uses. When those people hijacked those planes and drove them into buildings, yeah, the plane was involved, but behind that whole thing were thoughts. When Hitler put all those people to death, with government and military power, yes, but behind Hitler's whole deal were thoughts. You know how he came to power? Speeches and propaganda. You know what speeches are, right? They're just the expression of thoughts. Thoughts were behind all of that. And I believe that same weapon is what Satan uses to attack you and I today. Thoughts. Thoughts. And if you noticed it, I don't know if you noticed it or not, it was the same thing in the garden just now. Did you catch it? Okay, go back to Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any wild animal the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you'll die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to her, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Listen, this moment is how sin entered into the world. Right there. All the pain and devastation and death that has ridden humanity for the past thousands and thousands of years up until present day and that will continue to happen until Christ returns, all came through this moment, and it came through a thought. You will certainly not die. It's a thought. And the rest is history. Satan used a thought, and specifically a lie, to disconnect the human race from God. When you think about what, 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 what lies are, they're really just thoughts that are wrong. They're statements or, or thoughts that are, that are inaccurate that you believe. So when a kid lies to their parents and says, yes, I ate my breakfast when they didn't, that's just a, a thought or that's a statement that's not true. Or yeah, I cleaned my room, but they didn't, they didn't. again, that's just, a, that's just a wayward thought. It's a wayward statement that they're using. And through an inaccurate thought, through a lie, the human race became disconnected from God and the mind was the soil where that battle was lost. I want you to notice that. Last week we started talking about the mind. And the mind, if we're going to recap, the mind is the space in a human where all your thoughts and, and beliefs form. So I said last week, if the brain is what regulates the body, I think the mind is what regulates the soul. It's, it's deeply spiritual. It's extremely powerful because your mind is what forms what you feel and what you think and how you behave and ultimately what you become. And because of this, because the mind is so powerful and intricate into the human soul, it's the space where most or the primary, uh, the primary space of, of spiritual warfare. Because if Satan can get you to think wrong, if he can get you to miss the mark in your thinking, he'll get you to miss the mark in your living. And we're witnessing that right here. Satan is waging war on the human race. 
seeking to disconnect us from God, and he was doing it through the mind. And as we continue to work through this passage, I want you to be extra sensitive to how involved the mind is in all of this. I want you to see this text with new eyes. Go back to verse 4, please. The serpent says, you will certainly not die, for God knows when you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. In this moment, he's challenging Eve's thought life, attacking her mind. Verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. The scripture says, when the woman saw, I want you to circle that in your notes, on your bulletin. You should have the scripture there in verse 6. When the woman saw, circle saw, that word can be translated as to see, but it's also translated as to perceive or to consider. That's what it's meant to, 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 to convey here. So when the woman perceived that the fruit was good for food, when she perceived that it would give her wisdom, Listen, this is not talking about her eyes. It's talking about her mind right now. Do you see that? It's not talking about what she's seeing. It's talking about what she's thinking. When Eve disobeyed God and walked away from him, she was thinking thoughts. She was thinking, oh, this, this food is, is good for food. She was thinking, this will make me wise. She's thinking God is wrong. She's believing lies. All this has to do with her mind. This is how impactful the mind is. Again, this moment launched an avalanche of pain and destruction, and it all came through the mind. All started with a thought. Listen, you better be aware of what's shaping your mind. Serious. You better be serious about protecting your mind and strengthening your mind. Parents, as a father of six, you better be intentional about protecting the minds of your children. Don't play with this stuff. It's how the whole world fell apart, through the mind. Go to verse 7, please. It says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And you note, know, circle, eyes of both of them were opened. The eyes of both of them were opened. What does that mean? Have they been walking around with their eyes closed this whole time? And they got the fruit and, oh, hey, we're naked. No. This has to do with their mind. They realized they were naked. They understood. They became aware. This is all about their mind. Now, before we dive even deeper into what's going on in the mind of Adam and Eve here, there's two questions we want to we look at. How is this connected life in the spirit? Because that's the series we've been going through. And also, what should Adam and Eve have done in this situation? All right, so first question, how is this connected to life in the spirit? It's connected to life in the spirit because if we're going to walk by the spirit, our mind is central in all of this. If we're going to live in the new nature that God has for us and live as the new creation he made us to be, our mind is at the center of that. And there's two disciplines I've said week after week after week that we have to come accustomed to if we're going to walk by the spirit. Can you tell me what they are? Awareness and what? Surrender. surrender. Everyone say awareness. awareness. Say Surrender. This is what life in the spirit is all about, awareness and surrender. If you're going to walk by the spirit, you have to exercise those disciplines in regards to your mind. You've got to be aware of what you are thinking, aware of the lies you may be believing, and then know how to surrender those lies, surrender your mind to God. Write down Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. Let's unpack this a little further. Romans 12, verse 1 to 2, New Testament. It says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good pleasing and perfect will. We dove into this last week, so I won't touch on it too much, but I want to review for a moment. The scripture says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. In other words, if I'm paraphrasing, do not walk by the flesh. 
do not live according to your old nature. Don't do that. Instead, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, also known as, a.k.a., instead, walk by the Spirit. Instead, walk according to your new nature. That's what the text is teaching us here. And how do you do that? By the renewal of the mind. Renewal of the mind. That word for renewal, it's a Greek word. The, old, the New Testament is written in Greek. And the Greek word for renewal is anachiosis. Say anachiosis. All right, why does that matter, anachiosis? That word can be translated as renewal, but it literally means to change something for the better. To change something for the better. So renewal is fine, but there's another word that I like even better because it looks, it looks at this from a different angle, renovation. Be transformed by the renewal or by the renovation of your mind. Any of you guys ever renovate something? So when you renovate something, what you're doing you're taking something that's old and you're making it new. You're taking something that's bad per se and you're making it good or you're making it better. So if you renew your house or if you renovate your house, you take those old cabinets that are all dusted and smelly and you tear them down and you throw them away and you put in new, better, more quality cabinets. You take those appliances that are failing you and you dispose of those appliances, and you replace them, you exchange them with newer, better appliances, and you tear out that smelly carpet, and you throw it in the trash, and you replace it with new hardwood or vinyl floors. You're taking something and making it better. Are you following me? And the people of God are called to renew their minds as they walk by the Spirit, meaning they're supposed to take their mind, identify those thoughts that are faulty, and dispose of them, trash them, throw them away, and replace them, exchange them with new thoughts that are consistent with the Word of God. If you're going to walk by the Spirit, you've got to know how to renovate your mind, transform your mind by the disposing of wayward thoughts and the acceptance and belief in new thoughts that are centered in the word of God. But in order to do this, it starts with us being aware of what we're thinking. You have to be able to identify exactly what is going on in your mind. And there's a major challenge with this for us because we tend to confuse our thoughts with our emotions. Very prominent. And when I ask people how they feel, almost every time they don't give the right answer. Not that there's a right answer, but when I ask them how they feel, they usually confuse it with their emotion. So often this happens. So let's do a quick recap of emotions and thoughts. Emotions and feelings are moods that you experience. It's feelings that you feel. There's six primary emotions. They should be in your bulletin. The six primary emotions are sadness, fear, disgust, anger, happiness, surprise. Those are your emotions. And your feelings sort of branch off of that. Thoughts are different. Thoughts are ideas. They're beliefs. They're thoughts that go on in your mind. Now, here's the difference between the two, or one of the differences between the two. Emotions are always true. Thoughts are not. Now, some of you are feeling feelings right now. You're feeling anxious. You're feeling uncomfortable. But if you're feeling that, you are proving my point. You are confusing thoughts with emotions. You are thinking, you're hearing me say there's no objective truth. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying emotions are always real, but thoughts are not. Let me explain. Emotions are always true because it's true that you are feeling that feeling. Let's say I'm sad. It does not matter what you think. It does not matter what you say. It does not matter if I should or should not feel it. Sadness is my current reality. That is what I am feeling. There's nothing to debate about that. It's just the reality. However, the reason I'm feeling sad might not be true. There's a difference. I'm sad, that's the emotion, but the reason behind it, the thought connected to it, might not be true. And when you confuse the two, what happens is that objective truth is lost, and now you're governed by relativism. And when you're governed by relativism, there's no accountability which leads to chaos and confusion every time. I'll give you an example of how this plays out, okay? A guy and a girl, teenage age, maybe young adults, they're taking a, a romantic stroll through the mall, sipping on some 
some lemonade and, and sugary Wetzel pretzels. Anybody like Wetzel pretzels? $28 bag of Wetzel pretzels, right? So they're taking this romantic stroll. He's got his arm around her. She's feeling good about herself. And another girl walks by. And the guy and the girl lock eyes. And there's a pause. And they're gazing at each other. And then the girl breaks the silence. Oh, my gosh, Tim, haven't seen you in forever. She runs up and gives him a big hug and tells him how good he looks. And it's so good to see him. And he exchanges the same thing to her. He introduces the girl to his girlfriend, and there's an awkward hello. She goes back to Tim, gives him one more big hug, and then goes about her way. And let's just say this is no longer a romantic stroll through the mall. <laughs> All right? This romantic stroll has turned into a cold, distant, darn near dangerous stroll <laughs> through the mall. So Tim's feeling uncomfortable. He says, hey, hey uh, how are you feeling? So his girlfriend says, I feel like that little tramp wants to be with you and you want to be with her, so why don't you give her these Wetzel pretzels and be with her? So Tim responds, and Tim says, uh, don't feel like that. And she responds and says, don't tell me how to feel. Let me have my feelings. You're just being defensive. And she goes and walks off. Now, there's a mess here, obviously. But you can't clean the mess up because there's an inaccurate foundation that's been laid. Tim asked her, how do you feel? And she said, I feel like that little tramp wants to be with you. Well, here's the thing. That little tramp wants to be with you, that's not an emotion. Look on your, your, your wheel. That little tramp wants to be with you isn't on there. <laughs> right? That's not, that's not an emotion. What she feels is anxious. What she feels is scared. What she feels is jealous. What she feels is threatened. And all those feelings are real and true. But the reason she's feeling them might not be true. She feels anxious and jealous and scared because she thinks her boyfriend wants to be with that little tramp. But if you can't determine the difference between the two, there's no objective truth anymore. Now you're just left to relativism. And you can't really clean up this mess because relativism means, well, I feel this, you feel that, and my feeling is truth. You've got to be able to distinguish between what you feel and what you think, or else objective truth is lost, relativism governs your situation, there's a loss of accountability, and when there's relativism, now you're left with chaos and confusion. We have to be able to tell the difference between our thoughts and our feelings. And this is what Adam and Eve should have done. They should have identified what it was they were feeling and identified what it was they were thinking and surrendered that to God. Okay, go to verse 8, please. Watch. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he walked in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord their God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called the man, where are you? And Adam answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Pause there. You're getting into Adam's mind. I don't know if you're seeing it or not. Okay, in your notes, circle, I was afraid, verse 9 or 10. I was afraid. Then circle, so I hid. I was afraid. What is that? It's an emotion. Hiding. What is that? It's a behavior. Remember, what shapes your behaviors and your feelings? Your thoughts. And so in this moment, we're getting into Adam's mind. He's doing all these things and feeling all these feelings because of what he's thinking. And don't miss this. His feelings and his behaviors are being formed by his thoughts, listen, about God. He's afraid and running because of what he's thinking about God. God. And this is now we're going deeper into the enemy's schemes. Satan wants you to believe lies about God. That's what he wants. For you to believe lies about God. Adam is scared. Adam's running because he thinks something wrong about God. What is that? I don't know. We can speculate all we want. But at the center of it, he's running because he doesn't believe God is safe on some level. 
He does not believe God is safe. He does not trust God. Now you can say, well, this is the fear of the Lord. No, it's not. The fear of the Lord leads you to run to God, not from God. A healthy fear, a proper fear of the Lord brings you to the Lord, not away from the Lord. Proverbs 1 verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding. What does that mean? Does that mean the fear of the Lord means to run away from him? No. If the fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding, that means that the fear of the Lord would lead me to God. He has an unhealthy fear of the Lord right now. He has a broken fear of the Lord because he's driven by inaccurate thoughts about God. He's not trusting him. He's not trusting God. And Eve is dealing with the same issue. Go back to verse 1, please. Genesis 1. Uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Look at Eve. Let's start in verse 2. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the trees in the middle of the garden. You must not eat or touch it or you'll die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said. God knows when you eat from that tree, your eyes will be open. You'll be like him, knowing good and evil. Can you see it? Say amen if you can kind of see it. He's attacking her thought life. You will not certainly die. In other words, God is wrong. That's what he's telling her. God doesn't know what he's talking about. What's going on here? You will be like him, knowing good and evil. God knows this. God is holding out on you. There's something good that you need that God won't give you. You can't trust him. He's attacking her thoughts about God. And the same lies that he used in the garden, understand, he uses on us. It's the same thing today. The enemy got them to break trust, to break faith in God. And this is a picture of walking in the flesh. This is how this is connected. When you walk in the flesh, you break faith. You stop trusting in God and start trusting in something else. <clears throat> trusting in yourself, trusting in your power, trusting in the world, trusting in whatever. But you break faith. You stop trusting in the Lord. And the mind is central to all of this. What Adam and Eve needed to do, they needed to practice what we've been talking about. They needed to practice awareness and surrender. What they needed to do is become aware of what they were thinking, aware of the lies that they were believing, and then surrender those lies by replacing them with the truth of who God really is. So when they were thinking God is not trustworthy, they should have said, no, 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 God is trustworthy. I know it because he formed me. I know it because he placed me in this garden. I know it because he blessed me with a spouse. No, he, he is trustworthy. And when they thought, oh, God's not safe, they should have said, no, 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 God is safe. He, he, he's the one who, who knit me together. He's the one who took that ball of clay and, and, and made me from that. And they were thinking, you know, uh, God doesn't care about me or, or God's word can't be trusted. They should have said, no, no, God's word can be trusted. In fact, he just spoke all of this into existence by the power of his word. Everything I see came about by his word. No, his, his word can be trusted. And we have to do the same thing. You've got to be able to identify the lies that you're believing and then replace those lies, exchange those lies, renovate your mind according to the truth of God's word. There's four disciplines I want to encourage you to, to, to write down that will help you build the foundation, so to speak, of the renewal of your mind. These things are necessary for you to start, to start applying the renewing of your mind, the renovation of your mind as you walk in the spirit. Here's the first one. Read the word. Write it down. Read the word. Why? In the Bible, you'll learn who God is. You'll learn how God is. You'll learn what God has done. Reading the Bible will help you think rightly about God. It starts there. Second practice, believe the word. Believe the word. One thing to read it, it's another level to believe it. This is where you need God's help. You can't believe the word apart from God. And that sounds weird. But, but faith isn't something you muster up in yourself. 
Faith is a gift. It's a grace that God must impart unto you. And so you read the Bible. You say, God, I see that you're this way. I'm struggling to believe it. Give me faith, God. Give me faith to believe that which I am reading. It's faith. It's dependence. You've got to cry out to God for this. It's not going to just happen. You're not going to believe the word by just trying harder. It just does not work like that. You believe the word by crying out to God, confessing that you struggle, and asking him to help you believe it on your soul, in the soul level. Read the word. Believe the word. Third one, memorize the word. Memorize the word. You've got to memorize the word. When temptation comes and you are tempted to believe something about God that is not true, you've got to have some sort of truth to draw from. You can't be like, well, I, I, God loves me because I, I don't know, I, I think he loves me. You've got to have the word memorized in your mind. No, God loves me because of this verse. God loves me because of this verse. When Satan attacked Jesus, he fought back with, it is written, it is written, it is written. You've got to have the word in your mind, in your heart. Fourth and final one. There's more than this, but fourth one, you've got to speak the word. You've got to speak the word. You've got to speak the word to yourself. You've got to speak the word to your enemy. You've got to speak the word to one another. This is vital. You've got to speak the word to one another. This is why we're in community. When somebody's going through something, yes, encouraging each other is good. We should do that. But it's even greater to speak the word of God to one another. To give someone a scripture, to give someone a timeless truth found in God's word that they can hold on to and that they can believe that would bring life unto them. We gotta read the word, we gotta believe the word, we gotta memorize the word, and we gotta speak the word. This will build the foundation for us to overcome the enemy with the lies that he has. Now, from this passage, I wanna draw from it four lies that are not explicit, but I think that are implicit, meaning they're sort of indirect that Satan is attacking the minds of Adam and Eve with. And I want you to write them down because. I want you to become aware of when you're believing these lies as well. Again, they're, they're, st they're still consistent today. So here's the first lie to write down. God is wrong. God is wrong. That's a lie that he said back then that he gets us to believe today. God is wrong. You will not certainly die. God is wrong. God don't know what he's talking about. Very basic lie of the enemy. To get you to think God's word ain't true. Second lie to write down. God is wrong. The next one is, God is holding out on you. Following Jesus, you're missing out on something. No, it's not true. God is wrong. It's going to try to attack your mind with. Third one, this is a huge one. This drives so much human behavior, whether you realize it or not. Write this one down. God is not enough. You do. We do. I do. So much stuff because I believe that God is not enough. You never say it, but deep down, that's what's going on. God is not enough, so I'm doing this. God is not enough, so I need this relationship. God is not enough, so fill in the blank. And you can do the right thing with the wrong motive. And we do a lot of right things with the wrong motive of God not really being enough. You'd be surprised if God revealed to you how much you may do because you don't believe he truly is enough. Fourth one, God is not safe. God is not safe. That's why Adam's running. He don't think he can trust God. God is angry at you, right? That's, 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 God is not safe. It's a lie. He used back then. He's using today. And the fifth, and there's more than these, but these are just ones that I draw out very, I think, somewhat clearly from this text. The fifth one is God doesn't love you. God don't love you. Look at you. Oh, you should be shamed. You're garbage. You're worthless. Why would God love you? It's a lie of the enemy. You've got to be able to identify it. You've got to be able to, to see it so that you can surrender it. We need to be aware. What am I thinking? What am I believing? And then renew our mind with the truth of God's word. So when you hear the enemy or you're starting, to, you're starting to realize that you're believing that God is wrong, you need to renew your mind with Matthew 24, verse 35. Write it down. It won't be on the screen. Matthew 24, 35, where Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. Matthew 24, 35. Write down Luke 1, 37. Luke 
1, 37, an angel is talking to someone and they need confidence. And the angel says, no word of the Lord will ever fail. God is not wrong. Don't believe that lie. Luke 1, 37 tells me God's word will never fail. And when the enemy comes to your mind, attacking you, saying that, oh, God is holding out on you, you renew your mind with Matthew chapter 7, verses 10 to 11. Matthew 7, 10 to 11 talks about how God withholds no good gift from his children. What kid asked their dad for a fish and the dad gives him a scorpion? Doesn't happen. Well, if you as humans know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much greater does your heavenly father know how to give gifts to his children? No, that's not true that God's withholding something from me. The Bible tells me so. I either don't need it or I'm not ready for it. Don't believe the lie. And when the enemy comes at you saying that God is, is not enough, you renew your mind with Matthew 16, verse 25. Matthew 16, 25. What good is it if a man gained the whole world but forfeit his soul? What good is it if you have every car, every woman, every man, every position, all the Instagram followers, if you have everything in this world but you're disconnected from Christ, it is rubbish. It's no good at all. That's what the scripture is teaching us. You renew your mind with the truth of God's word. You can write down Philippians 1.21. <clears throat> Philippians 1.21, Paul says, for to me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. What does that mean? It means that the purpose of living is serving Christ. And even if I die, it's a gain because I'll be with Christ. You need to renew your mind with that. Renew your mind with Philippians 3, 7 to 8. Write that down, Philippians 3, 7 to 8. God is not enough. Oh, yes, he is enough. Because Paul says in Philippians 3, 7 to 8, I consider everything that I've attained garbage. I consider it rubbish in comparison to knowing Christ. You've got to renew your mind with this stuff. And when the enemy attempts you to say that God is not safe, that God is angry at you, you renew your mind with Psalm 103, 8 to 12. Psalm 103, 8 to 12, which says that God is slow to anger, abounding in love. He does not treat you or me as our sins deserve. But as far as the east is from the west, so has he separated. Oh, Oof. You got to believe this stuff. Mm. Look away so I can get myself under control. <laughs> anyway, Psalm 103.8. And lastly, when, when, when you're tempted, <clears throat> you're um, tempted to believe God doesn't love you. No, you renew your mind with John 3.16, right? God so loved the world, gave his only son. Whoever believed in him will not perish, but ever left in life. Uh, you renew your mind with Romans 5.6-8. <clears throat> Romans 5.6-8. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When you are tempted to believe that God does not love you, you renew your mind with the gospel. You look to the cross for the gospel is your reminder. It is your evidence that, no, God does truly love you. But you got to have it in your mind. you got to believe it. got to believe it. So let's recap. We covered a lot. Satan's primary weapon to bring pain and destruction is what? Say it, say it like you believe it. Thoughts, good, specifically lies, right? Thoughts are how Satan uh, attacks you. Our mind is the space where all of our thoughts and, and feelings originate, and it's very powerful. It's going to shape what we do and what we become and how we feel and how we act. And so because of that, Satan's going to attack your mind with lies about you and lies about God. If he can get you to miss the mark in your thinking, he'll get you to miss the mark in your living. And so we've got to walk by the Spirit, meaning we've got to be aware of what we're thinking, aware of the lies we're believing, and then renovate our minds by replacing that garbage we're believing and, re and exchanging it with the truth of who God is. So let's make this very practical as we get ready to close. Soul work for this week. It's a lot to do because we don't want this to be just a sermon that entertains you for 40 minutes. We want this to be transformational for you and your marriage and your family. So this is how you can take it and make it real. First thing, write these down. I want you to practice distinguishing between emotions and thoughts. Start there. 
Practice distinguishing between emotions and thoughts. We put one of those emotion things in your, in your emotions wheel again so that you can start just working on that. Hey, what am I feeling and why am I feeling that? What am I feeling? That's the, that's the emotion. What's the thought connected to it? All right, so I'm, I'm scared. Well, why are you scared? Well, because I'm afraid this person thinks different of me, right? That, the, those are the two differences. What are you feeling? What are you thinking? The second thing to work on this week, to reflect upon in your quiet time. Are there any lies specifically about God that you're believing? Are there any lies specifically about God that you are believing or that you tend to believe? Do you tend to believe that uh, God, is, God is wrong or God is withholding something from you or God is not enough or God is not safe and trustworthy or God doesn't love you? I want you to start identifying that. Really reflect upon that this week and throughout the week. If you're, if, you're, if you're attentive to it, I trust God will reveal a lie that you may believe from time to time about him. Third thing, I want to encourage you to memorize. Oh, i got to memorize something. It's your mind, okay? Memorize at least one scripture that's connected to the thought that's wayward about God that you believe. One scripture. So if you... If you come to realize that you sometimes doubt God's love for you, you need to memorize John 3.16 or Romans 5, 6 to 8. Or if you sometimes believe that God's word is wrong, you need to memorize Matthew 24.35 or Matthew, uh, Luke 1.37. Hopefully you guys wrote all the scriptures down earlier that I said because they're connected to the, the thing. If you're not, you can go back and ask a neighbor. Hopefully they took notes or whatever. So distinguish your thoughts from your feelings. Identify the lies you're believing. Memorize one scripture. Then the fourth and final one, share your reflections with one other person in the church. Make this real. As you share what God is revealing to you, and they share what God is revealing to them, you're strengthening one another. You sharing might not be for you. It might be for them. But if you don't have a safe person in the church to do that with, I would start praying, God, bless me with a safe relationship that can help cultivate this sort of growth in my life. The enemy is after your mind. But we have victory in the word of God. Renew our minds with the truth of God's word. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's pray. Mm. Lord, would you please renew our minds? Renovate our mind. Help us become more aware and help us become more willing to surrender. Please help us be intentional this week about um, being in solitude, taking 10 minutes of just silence and just asking, asking you, hey, God, would you please help me to, uh, to understand what I'm feeling and what I'm thinking? Really commit to that. And then... Maybe later in the week to ask God, God, would you please help me understand what lies I'm believing about you? God, would you please give me the strength to start memorizing scripture that will renew my mind? And God, would you please open up a door for me to be able to share these reflections with with somebody else in the church for my growth? If, If you're serious about growing, you have a plan that will bring growth by God's grace. So God, please bless those who are serious and and give them the faith, the grace, the diligence, the time to do this. All so that we might have minds that are surrendered to you, that we might bring you more glory because we look more like Jesus, and that we might live for the good of our neighbor. Help us take it serious, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody sit together. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. Give God praise as we close. Sing together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures. He
center outside we have a gift for you if you need prayer for anything our prayer team will be here they love to encourage you pray with you and again I just want to uh, just encourage you obviously I, I know there's intensity but I hope you see the urgency because from the seat that I sit in I'm, I feel like I'm having more and more clarity that there is just, it's just all about the mind it's all about the mind and so if you're gonna be diligent to become more aware of what you're thinking and what you're believing if you're able to start identifying lies and realize how those lies are affecting you you start surrendering that through the renewal of your mind, your life will change. And not just so you can have a better life, but so that God can be more glorified and that the good of your neighbor might be done and, and you'll be blessed by that. So I wanna encourage you to press into these things by God's grace and let's continue to grow together, amen? Amen, all right, God bless you, we'll see you next week.